I want everyone to hold extremely still. In fact, don't move a muscle. And I want you to imagine you've lost movement and sensation in your hands, your arms, your legs, your entire body. And finally, you can't speak. You can't talk to your loved ones or anyone around you. We're all a moment away from having an accident or a stroke that could lead to one or more of these conditions. It happened to me. I was in graduate school and out one evening with friends when I ended up in the wrong place at the wrong time. I was grabbed from behind and thrown down, thrown down on the concrete, and my head bounced off the pavement. I was rushed to the hospital and had two life-saving operations that night to stop the bleeding in my brain. I had what was called uh, a traumatic brain injury and expressive aphasia. I couldn't speak. I could only say literally a couple of words. Doctors told my family they didn't know if I would recover. But with time, intensive therapy, and an incredible amount of luck, I did recover. But there are millions of people around the world living today that have either had an injury to their brain or their spinal cord, and they have not been able to recover and have not been as lucky as I was. They are living with so many complications, including paralysis. So today I'm going to tell you about an idea that my colleagues at Battelle and working with OSU Medical Center as well to help folks that are living with paralysis one day regain movement. That's our goal. The idea is to actually take signals from a certain part of the brain and reroute them around the injury, whether it's to the brain or the spinal cord, and then reinsert those signals back into the muscles to allow someone who's paralyzed to regain movement. This has been a very tough challenge, but we've been working on it for many years, and I want to share some of the results to you today. We believe this will open up so many new doors, even in the area of stroke recovery, because if you can bypass an injured part of the nervous system, uh, you can start to regenerate uh, some of the cells involved. You can start to promote the health. But this idea of a bypass is not new. In 1962, uh, the first aortic valve bypass was performed. And in this case, you're trying to reroute blood around an abnormal part of the heart. But if we're gonna do a neural bypass, we actually are bypassing electrical signals in the nervous system. This presents many challenges that we had to overcome, and we'll talk about that. So if we can do this, we can open so many doors, and we can really uh, create a new frontier. So when I finished graduate school and had recovered, uh, it was a really strange twist of fate. I ended up in the medical technology field. I really had not planned on that at all. And after several years, I was asked one day to be on a project that involved working with a woman who had a brainstem stroke and a man who had ALS, or Lou Gehrig's disease. Both were paralyzed and both could not speak. My job was to analyze their brain activity and try to decipher that activity so that we could make sense out of it. And in fact, we were trying to have them imagine different movements so we could tell what they were thinking. And then we were using that uh, those techniques to basically allow them to interface with a computer, and in one case, even drive a wheelchair around the room just by thinking about it. We were doing great things and making great progress, but something struck me at that time. We still had not given them movement. We needed to do better. So we started a project called NeuroBridge. And the whole idea was to see if we could create an entire neural bypass and build upon the great work that other researchers had done and some of the things that we had done about 10 years ago and see if we could reroute these signals around a spinal cord injury or even a brainstem injury, for example, and allow someone who's paralyzed to move again. And not only move their wrist and hand, but individual fingers. So to do this, you have to have several key components. So we do have to have a brain implant. And you may wonder, why do you need that kind of surgery? To get the fidelity in these kinds of signals and the uh, quality and the information content we need, 
especially to allow someone to move individual fingers, you need to place this brain implant into a special area of the brain, the motor cortex. And next, we knew we would need these, what we call decoding algorithms. These allow us to actually tell when someone who's paralyzed is thinking about a movement that they want to make, okay? But now we're missing other pieces. Once we have that, we have to use what are called recoding algorithms or encoding algorithms to actually emulate the spinal cord. And we're gonna talk about that. An incredibly important part of the nervous system. The spinal cord is not just a conduit to take signals from the brain to the muscle. The spinal cord helps you move. It helps you walk. And the final piece would be, we would need stimulating electrodes that could pinpoint tiny muscle segments to allow us to get this fine movement. So we had a tremendous amount of work to do and we pulled the whole system together over a few years, but then we were faced with a challenge. How do you decode brain activity and interpret thoughts? So this goes back to some early work that we helped with. And here what you're seeing are a whole bunch of signals from someone who's paralyzed thinking about movements. It's chaos. We have, it's like walking into a huge room like this and there's hundreds of people that are having conversations and you're trying to isolate one particular conversation. And then guess what? You find out you don't know the language they're speaking. So we have to learn it. So what we do, we call it a mathematical transformation. And I'm gonna show you something here where as we make this transformation, we try to take all of this chaos and this randomness, seemingly random data and take it into a space that has more uh, pattern, it kind of pattern to it, and organization. And this is what emerges. This is just one simple technique we use, but each color is actually a different thought. I had asked the patient to think about wrist flexion, extension, and even side-to-side -side movements. Every color is an individual thought. And red is actually rest. Even when you try not to think about movement, the brain is extremely active and there's a lot going on. So in essence, we were reading their minds, their inner thoughts, but only about movement, so don't, don't get worried. <laughs> okay, so how do we learn the language of the neurons? Uh, well, if you went to a foreign country and you didn't know the language, you probably would point to things and hope somebody would say the term. So we use association. We do the same thing with the patients. We made this hand that demonstrates each movement and we collect brain activity at the same exact time and we link them together. Everything from wrist to individual finger movement. But now, we wanted to emulate the spinal cord and we wanted to be able to allow the patients to do dynamic and coordinated type movements. Your spinal cord helps you even with walking as I mentioned. So as you move, it is taking care of all of these processes and it's doing a tremendous amount of computation. There's a place in your spinal cord we can stimulate electrically and you'll actually see an entire cycle of movement in your leg without brain involvement at all. So the brain is kind of like upper management. They really don't know about what's going on with the details. <laughs> I'm only kidding. <laughs> okay, so now that we had kind of pulled a lot of the critical pieces together and developed a lot of this over the years, we were ready to do a demonstration here, and we were really not expecting a lot on the first try. But this is a young man who's paralyzed, and we are trying to emulate the spinal cord and generate these rhythmic movements in the fingers. And so this is a simple app on a, on a phone, and it's called the Guitar App, and it has tiny little strings on the screen. They're very close together. So we were trying to see, could we isolate individual finger movement, and could we see some kind of a pattern? So I want you to listen very carefully on what happened. It was unbelievable. The patterns were not only uh, creating a rhythm, but they were repeatable, and we were able to do it again and again. It was absolutely amazing. And so, we were, and we were very surprised, in fact. But now that the pieces were falling together, we felt we were ready to start a clinical trial a small clinical study where we would attempt to bring together the entire neural bypass and demonstrate it in someone who's completely paralyzed. And so we had the fortune of meeting a young man who was interested in the study. His name is Ian. He had an accident about four years ago that left him paralyzed from the middle of his chest down and his wrist and hands. 
He has a little bit of elbow and shoulder movement, and he uses that to drive his chair and do a number of things. But I have a little surprise for you. Would you like to meet Ian? Ian, come on out. Okay. Well, I want to explain one thing first. You may notice that Ian has a connector here, literally screwed to his skull. That may sound a little graphic, but it actually allows us to tap in to the signals from the tiny sensor, the brain implant, that's placed in his motor cortex. Uh, it's the size of a pea. It's actually a little bit smaller. And it's, again, so important because that gives us that high-fidelity set of signals that we need to decode uh, Ian's brain activity. But we'll show you kind of what's been made possible by this. Um, Ian, though, can you just take a moment to talk about what happened four years ago? I was on vacation with some friends after completing my freshman year of college, and we were out playing in the waves down in North Carolina. I dove into a wave that pushed me down into a sandbar and felt a whole sense of numbness. Uh, later on that day at the hospital, I received the news that I had um, suffered a spinal cord injury and the diagnosis of a quadriplegic. Yes. And I know, obviously, it's been extremely difficult for you and, and your family. Um, and, you know, I remember when we first met, you had mentioned you know, a few years have passed, you've, uh, you know, gotten used to using technology to get around, you have your wheelchair, and you said to me that you have all of that, but there's nothing really available to help you with your hand and hand movement. And so I wanted to show the next video on what you have just accomplished very recently. You continue to amaze us every week, every month. Yet yeah, Ian had said he just wanted to be able to, I remember when you mentioned opening your hand, just picking up a cup, and just being able to do it on your own. So I just want to say a couple things. You know, you've taught me and the entire team really how to live life with courage, determination, and dignity, you know, even when life throws, its, uh, throws at us some extremely difficult circumstances. Uh, you know, we're truly entering a final frontier, a new frontier in medicine and technology where we believe the uh, possibilities are really endless. And we think a neural bypass type of idea can help folks that are living either with spinal cord injury or brain injuries or even are trying to recover from a stroke. And when we think of frontiers, we really think of pioneers. We think of folks that were brave enough to try something that's really never been done before. And we think of Chuck Yeager breaking the sound barrier. We think of Amelia Earhart crossing the Atlantic, Jerry Mock, for those from Columbus, circling the globe. And we think of John Glenn orbiting the Earth. And so I want to share just one last photo and end on that. And Ian actually had a chance to meet John Glenn very recently. <laughs> It was an incredible moment. And I tell you, if you ask me, when I look at this photo, I see two pioneers. Thank you. And thank you. So 
I'm going to ask Ian one last question, which is on my mind, and I'm sure it's on yours. This is a lot, living with this device in your head all the time. And I know they put you through a lot of trials. Why are you doing this? I always knew after getting injured that at some point in my lifetime, there'd be some advance in science and technology that would allow me to regain function of something that I thought had been lost forever. Um, and now with the help from Chad and his team, it's not a matter of if, but when we'll be using something like this in our everyday life. Thank you.